Oh, I love that music, ladies and gentlemen. Do you think we should just do a little bit of a boogie just to get things kicked off? Why not? Good afternoon. Welcome to the wonder that is Global Table. Are you guys having a good time? Are you having a good time? Yeah, yeah there we go. That's what we like for an after lunch crowd. Um, one person who's not having a fantastic time right now is Veronica Phil, who is going to be our fourth panelist uh, this afternoon. Veronica has taken ill, so she won't be joining us. But we promise you an action-packed uh, session nonetheless. Um, my name's Pat Nurse. Uh, I'm the creative director of Food & Wine Victoria. Um, my history in dining, if I can give it to you in brief, is 20 years as a restaurant critic. Uh, I've been the head of voting for Australia and Oceania for the world's 50 best restaurants since 2006. Um, I am on the Tourism Australia Glo uh, Food Advisory Panel, and I've probably eaten more hot dinners than most people have eaten hot dinners. Um, over the last 20 years that I've been a, a dining professional, I've never seen a more volatile time in restaurants than now, in Australia in particular. Uh, we have a perfect storm of changes in policy, changes in technology, change, changes in the way we eat, changes in the way we live even, ladies and gentlemen, that have created the least certain uh, period in recent restaurant history. It's a time of challenges, but perhaps it's also a time of opportunities, and I think we're really uh, well placed with today's panel to really kick this around. I hope you'll join me in welcoming Stephen Premutico from Me and You. Uh, Laurent, I don't know how to say your last name, Laurent, I'm so sorry. Stevenin. Plus you say it better than me. Laurent Stevenin and John Anderson. Thank you, John, for having such an easy to pronounce name. I love you. In addressing appetite for change. Gentlemen, there's two mics on the table. Why don't we go across the panel? Maybe you can just tell me a little bit about what connects you to dining and why you're here what you can bring to this conversation. So Stephen, what do you got, what do you got for us? Hello guys, uh, it's great to be here. Um, I'm an Italian boy who grew up around food and I think ever since then, I've been deeply passionate about this industry. Uh, for the past 10 years, I created Dimmy, which is the online booking platform for Australia. Um, I took a year off and now I'm back to launch Me and You. Uh, Me and You is an app that will change the way that we order and pay in restaurants. Um, yeah, and we're just at the beginning of the journey. All right, Laurent. Thanks for having me. Uh, so my name is Laurent, I'm originally from Belgium. I'm now a commercial director of Deliveroo in Singapore, uh, and having the opportunity to spend a month here in Australia uh, to share some best practices uh, between the, the different countries. So I've had the opportunity to work at Deliveroo for the past four years. Uh, we've definitely seen massive changes uh, you know, in the food delivery industry uh, within these uh, four years. And um, yeah, I'm uh, today uh, taking care and uh, you know, trying to build relationships with 5,000 restaurants in Singapore. So it's uh, yeah, definitely a connection there. Fantastic. John, John Anderson. Um, hi, my name is John Anderson, and uh, I'm uh, from Hawaii originally. Uh, my background's mostly in commercial marketing, uh, sales and marketing. I came from oil and gas. Before that, I worked in SaaS, um, and then again into SaaS before I came into uh, the group. Um, I came in uh, on uh, invitation from the CEO. So we're trying to uh, commercialize and uh, look to grow the, 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 the portfolio. Um, What's, what's currently in the portfolio? John, I know there's a, pretty much everyone in this room will have been to a VU Group restaurant, but... Sure. We've got, uh, we've got 12 different brands that, that we represent, the top one being uh, Vue de Monde, um, which was founded by Shannon Bennett about 20 years ago. Um, we've also got Ikajime, uh, we've got uh, the Cafe Views, we've got Barista by Vue, Benny Burgers, we've got uh, Jardin Tan, Piggery Cafe, um, as well as Burnham Beaches. We've got uh, Getty's Lane, which is a, a nightclub. Um, and we've got Louis Bar and View Events. Yeah, so we've got quite a few. So between us, ladies and gentlemen, I think it's safe to say we cover everything from Netflix and chill to the highest fine dining in the land. That's right. Uh, gentlemen, the, the title of this session is Appetite for Change. How much of an appetite for change do you see 
in the restaurant business. And, and I might throw to you first there, Stephen. Um, what, what I'd say is that when I started Dimmy 12 years back, um, it was an industry that I thought at the time was very fragile. Um, what I'd say now is that that was a glorious time compared to what the industry is facing right now. Um, I, I think it's an industry that is exceptionally tech poor, tech illiterate, um, and is probably fearful of technology in this country. Um, and I think as an industry, we, are, we, we need to be very careful because I think it's, especially in this country, you know, it's an industry that has 4% profit margins, an industry that's doing 20%, you know, 20% um, of businesses that open this year won't survive the end of the year. So it's an industry that's um, in a very delicate situation. And I think that as an industry, we need to embrace technology if we're going to sort of ride the curve and kind of get through the next couple of years. So I'd say that um, it's, um, it's an industry that right now is very slow to adopt and embrace technology that can be critical to its survival. Why do you suppose that is? Um, I think because if you think about the people who head up this industry, we're deeply passionate about one thing, and that is not making money. That's <laughs> as you know, it, that's about putting great food on people's plates and customers walking out with a smile, and that's a very beautiful place to come from. But I think that evolution has got to change and I think bringing people in like John who are not hospitality people but are pioneers from outside this industry can truly help us. Um, I think it's a bit of that and I think it's a bit of us having been burnt by tech solutions in the past so I think we can be a bit fearful about you know kind of going all in um, when we may have been burnt uh, in the past. Laurent I'd like to put you on the spot in many conversations I've had with restaurant operators in Australia, they, they talk about, particularly in the fine dining space, they talk about um, Deliveroo and Uber Eats as a boogeyman, as a, one of the challenges they're facing. Is that a, is that a fair description of, of your place in the marketplace? I think that today, um, the, the consumer, uh, I'll answer your question uh, from a consumer point of view. I think the consumer is a lot more demanding. Expectations go up. They want more flexibility. They want selection. And they want impeccable service. Um, and I think that Deliveroo is in a place where it can actually bring this. Um, and therefore, working with the restaurant industry and uh, helping out uh, the restaurant industry with this, we'll, we'll be able to meet uh, the demand of the consumers. And therefore, everybody's a winner. Thank you. I mean, Sharma Sukul Lee, our, our keynote speaker today, actually sort of gave a thumbnail sketch of what disruption looks like. Uh, she said, there's, it really just comes down to two things, whatever industry you're in. Is the product better than the status quo? And can you deliver at a better price than status quo? What does that mean, John Anderson, for someone running 10 restaurants? Different things, different things across the group, um, particularly at... Uh, at Vudemont, at the very high, at the very high end, um, we've noticed that uh, it's it's less about necessarily not necessarily spending a large amount, but more the expenditure of time. So we've introduced a new sort of abbreviated menu that seems to be opening up the market to different uh, buyer personas um, to the group, which is which has been excellent for us. Really increase our coverage and uh, um, engagement through digital channels as well as, you know, getting um, bookings through from all types of different uh, um, buyer groups. Now, you just used the phrase buyer persona. Historically, CRM uh, in the restaurant business has looked a lot like the chef writing angry words in blood in the reservations book or maybe just putting a picture of a restaurant critic with a big cross through their face in the kitchen. Are those days behind us? I mean, is, is the restaurant business actually engaging with data now? Is that, is that a, a happening thing? S certainly, uh, we're noticing lots of changes across the group, particularly at Vue de Monde. Um, if you sit down for what's really a 16-dish experience, what we're finding is that people are there for two and a half hours. Of that time, they're picking up their, their phones 26 times. 
John is counting how many times you are picking up your phone at Voudemont. Well, that, we're, getting that, we're getting that data from surveys. <laughs> okay. So 26 times, and people are spending roughly about, an, uh, about a minute. So that's sharing through data, sharing, sharing through social media. Yeah. I have a little anecdote about maybe seven years ago, I went to a three Michelin star restaurant, and they put a, uh, a, uh, an iPad in front of me. And in that iPad, they just showed me pictures of what I was about to eat which I thought was very, a very clunky experience. Now, I think we talked about this yesterday, or the day before, sorry, that uh, the mobile phone seems like to, an extension of uh, a human body now. So people are using them in different ways. So if we can engage people in our story when they pick up their, their phone, I think that that's where we need to meet the market where it's at, Meeting, bring innovation in at a, a relevant time. I swear to God, this is not a layup, but that's a perfect introduction, introduction of what's happening at Me and You. So give us a thumbnail sketch, Stephen, of what, what Me and You is all about. We're, we're let, in a, we've let, sat down in a restaurant. Yeah. Okay, let me, let me perhaps talk about the problems that I, I see first, and I'll explain um, how I, I hope, I deeply hope that Me and You can solve some of those problems. The idea being that we walk into a restaurant and the host, most often than not, doesn't know who we are is crazy in the hospitality industry. The idea being that you, know, you stand in a queue to wait for service in a pub. The idea that you need to wait five, six, seven, eight minutes at the end of a meal to pay and to have that awkward moment where you're trying to work out how you're gonna split the bill. Like the, this is just for, such a foreign concept for consumers in today's society because you get into an Uber, you push a button, uh, and an Uber arrives at the front of your home and then, you know, five minutes later you're gone and you didn't even do anything. There is so many points of friction in our industry, it's, it's crazy. Um, so I think for an in industry that needs to evolve and grow, first and foremost, we've got to address some of those points of friction and we've got to make sure the customers are delighted. So um, I think the big dream with me and you is really simple. We want to do two things. Number one is we want to make the customer experience better than it's ever been before. And number two is we want to help the bottom line of this industry by improving some of their profits. The way we do that is that when a customer rocks up uh, into a venue, they tap their phone on the table, they get a beautiful menu just like Instagram, and I'm ordering through a beautiful digital menu that I can personalize if I'm vegan or if I'm gluten free. Um, and the fascinating thing that we're seeing here at this point is that customers are spending 15 to 20% more because they're seeing images and we're giving them upsells. So through using the app, they're spending more money in restaurants? 15 to 20% more. That you send the order, goes directly to the kitchen. The waiter is still involved in the process, but the, the waiter's role is now evolving. So rather than the waiter being simply doing order taking and cash collecting, the role of the waiter evolves to being a host. So to serving, to hosting, to building a relationship, to upselling, the magical stuff that we really want to happen in a restaurant, not coming and asking me how I'm going to pay my bill. And at the end, you push a button, you split the bill, and you go. That's what we're doing at Me and You. And theoretically in there, you are maybe saving some labor costs. So I'm gonna be brutally honest if I, if I can. I, I don't think this industry can survive in this, like in this country, we have the highest labor costs on the planet. Like it is bad, it's broken. So I think something has to give. So if, as an industry, we can... Like, cause it's happening right now. Because of what's happened over the past year, everyone in this industry has got one or two less waiters on the floor than they really need. That's fact. So what's happening is service is degrading. I'm waiting longer to get attention, and it's taking me longer to pay the bill. So, yes, I think as this plays out, the role of the waiter will evolve. Operators will save money on labor. It will be a different kind of labor, and customers are going to spend more and materially more. I see questions on your faces, ladies and gentlemen. The question could be, where can I get some of that chicken-free chicken? Or I, I wish I'd hugged Howard Yana Shapiro. But if your question pertains to this session, you can actually ask us that directly through the Global Table app, and Rob will be 
vetting your questions for interest and excitement in real time through this session. So if you have a question, don't be shy. Laurent, coming from a, a restaurant lens as I do, I've always been inclined to think of restaurants as a, a sort of an incubator for trends and ideas around dining. You know, often, oftentimes uh, it's the place where we trial new ingredients, we trial new techniques before they trickle down into, you know, more casual eateries and then into the supermarkets and, and people cooking at home. On the flip side, at, at Deliveroo, you now have a wealth of data coming from the ground up. What are you, what are you learning about your customers? What have been the key insights um, as the way people have used your platform has evolved in recent years? Yep. So, indeed, we, you know, we, uh, we deliver uh, thousands of orders uh, every day. Um, all over Australia and in the 13 markets. Uh, How many thousands? Do you know? Sorry? How many thousands? What's, what's the ballpark? Can you give us a number? Fortunately not. Ah. Thousands and thousands and thousands. That's a lot. That's a big number. Um, yeah, so, so a ton of data does, uh, does come through. Um, we'll focus on uh, the cuisine type, so what people actually want to eat. Uh, we'll look at uh, how much people are actually willing to pay. Um, we'll look at when people actually want to order and where people are going to order. And so, indeed, uh, by gathering all of this information, um, we're able to actually understand demand a lot better than you know, uh, what, uh, what we used to uh, in the past. And actually uh, suggest to restaurants uh, and, and have the ability to tell restaurants, okay, this works, this potentially doesn't. Um, we've been able to actually create virtual brands thanks to this. Uh, so rest, uh, brands that only exist uh, on, on Deliveroo uh, and for delivery. Can you, can you break that down for us? I'm, I'm not the brightest candle in the box, so can yeah. you talk me through what that means? Yeah. So uh, if we know that, uh, for example, people want to eat Mexican, they're willing to pay anywhere between uh, 10 and $20 for a burrito. Uh, and uh, this is something that's very, very popular in a particular area of the city. Um, we'll, be, we'll be looking at, okay, do we have Mexican brands or do we have uh, Mexican cuisine? Everywhere, right? Um, thanks to this information, if we find a gap, we'll be able to tell a restaurant, uh, which you know, is already a partner on uh, Deliveroo, okay, if you actually create uh, a burrito brand, or if you actually uh, serve and sell burritos at this precise price, we know you're gonna sell. So you might be a spaghetti restaurant or a wonton restaurant, but our data says that here where you are in, let's say, Edward Street, Brunswick East, uh, you will actually do better if you sell burritos. That, that actually answers a question for me. The other day I was walking down the street, sorry ladies and gentlemen, we're just taking a detour into Patland again. I was walking down Ligon Street and I was looking at this production kitchen looking thing. It didn't have a sign, but it had a queue of delivery drivers out the front. And I keep seeing this thing and I thought to myself, what is this? Like, is it a front for drugs? Is it a, you know, I don't know, I mean, maybe. I stuck my head in one day and I said, what, what is this place? And they said, oh, we're, we're all of these brands, but we're a production kitchen here. So through platforms like Deliveroo, the good people of the Republic of Brunswick had a taste for these things, but these things were not supported by restaurants in our neighborhood. So this production kitchen was created to meet that demand. Yeah, and we actually have two kitchens like that in uh, Melbourne. Is one uh, of them on Ligon Street? No. Okay. <laughs> they are Sorry, selling yeah. drugs. Okay, great. <laughs> Collingwood and Windsor. Okay. Collingwood and Windsor. There we okay. go. Um, so, so yeah, uh, these are called additions, uh, additions kitchens, and basically there, we select the restaurants that we're going to actually partner with only thanks to data and due to data. We'll be looking at the gaps within, uh, within, um, the, um, within the actual market and the, the delivery area, and we'll know what works and what doesn't. And at so which you know what Melbourne wants to eat at a given moment. You know when Melbourne is hungry. I, I remember hearing a, a great podcast from The Guardian where they talked about the data that uh, pret a manger captures. You know, this is the biggest sandwich company in the world, and their data is 
pristine and it is large. Is anyone here aroused by large clean data sets? I can tell you are. And they were saying they can pinpoint exactly when Britons are really hung over. They said the, the Friday morning before the last working week was the, the spike of bacon and egg sandwiches because it was the day after everyone in Britain had had their Christmas party at work. And then they said that dropped off for exactly three weeks when people had their New Year's resolutions and then exactly three weeks or two weeks into the New Year, bang, they were back on the bacon and egg sandwiches again. What can, we, what can we learn from these sorts of observations at the pointy end of the business, John? I mean, how can you put that into practice? You're observing people picking up their phones, you're presenting shorter menus. It feels like this is, these observations are in their infancy. Where are we going to be five or ten years down the track with this stuff? Making, making better planning and business decisions up front to, making, to make sure that we're meeting the market where it's at. And, and restaurants staying afloat. Absolutely. Um, and I, th I think that this is where we can use like the data analytics at the, at the intersection of potentially AI technology to help out with, say, if we know that, uh, that uh, food ordering is dropping off over two-week period after the new year, we know that uh, we can use uh, a lightened schedule across some of our venues, for instance, um, to make sure that we're accounting for that in our in our uh, in our day-to-day -day operations price. Um, Are there implications there for waste as well? I mean, with ordering, you can better observe your ordering so that you're not. Certainly, absolutely, and you know, I think it's uh, absolutely there's there's implications for that. Making sure that you know we're we're ordering less um, to meet the market where it's at. I was in a, a fan, one of the many fantastic global table sessions today, but it was a particularly good session about rethinking retail and um, had a buyer from uh, Planet Organic in the UK talking about provenance and all that sort of stuff that people get excited about. But he said, really, what it boils down to at the end of the day with consumers is trust. Stephen, how do you make people trust this new piece of technology? How do you, how do you, I mean, you, with Dimmy, you know, you're introducing something completely new to the market. What does the adoption process look like? So, Pat, can I go back a step and just talk about You can do whatever you want. You have the microphone. Because um, I, I think there's a fascinating parallel between our industry and Netflix. I'm going to use a really simple analogy. When we turn on and everyone clicks on Netflix, everyone gets a different set of recommendations. You and I most certainly get a different set of recommendations. <laughs> um, because what, what Netflix does is it is genius and one of the best businesses on the planet at using data science um, to make recommendations for us. So when I turn on Netflix, I get recommendations based on what I've liked and what I've watched in the past. In our industry, no matter who you are, no matter how, no, no, no matter how many times you've been into a particular restaurant or that you only drink Chablis, we still give you a big, fat, ugly menu and a wine list that's 100 pages long. It makes no sense. So why don't we as an industry use the data and the intelligence and the history that we know about customers to help them have a better dining experience? Why show a customer a full menu if they're a vegan? Why show them a full menu if they only like a particular type of, um, of gin? So that's where I think in time, as an industry, we need to get better and we can use data in the restaurant when the customer is sitting with you to A, know who they are and B, deliver a much more magical experience for them. Do we run the danger there of having a bit of the Facebook effect? You know, do we run the danger of bringing to food the kind of siloing that narrows experience? Uh, is there I'm going to be a Cambridge Analytica of snacks, you know? I just, I, I, I think that any, any of this stuff, whether it's tech or data, use it for good and there's never an issue. The Facebook analogy is a different one because it was used to monetize, you know, stuff. Like, the very simple idea here is that a customer goes into a restaurant, they want to know what's good, they know what, they, everyone wants a customer to walk out with a smile on their face. Let's help them pick better and enjoy better meals together. Laurent, what are the big challenges for your, for your business in the next five years? You guys, I mean, the, the, 
the great thing about being a killer app is that you're a killer app and you disrupt, but then you are ripe for being disrupted. I think we have many challenges, that's, uh, that's for sure. Um, I think it's a uh, you know, super, super fast-moving uh, sector. Um, it's, it's growing extremely rapidly. Uh, we have to stay on top of the ball, always innovate, and um, you know, uh, understand uh, the, the market trends before competition uh, does. Give me um, some examples there. What are, what are the trends that you guys are moving on right now yeah. that, are, that are, have reached the consumer level? Yeah, um, so I'll, I'll use uh, an example from, uh, from Singapore that I'm a little bit more familiar with. Uh, we're working super hard to hyper-localize selection, so basically to bring the more local uh, food options that you'll find in Singapore, which are hawkers, uh, food courts, uh, etc., which are, you know, very, very cheap. Uh, it's very cheap food, it's delicious, um, and we know that it's super popular with, um, for, with Singaporeans. So today, basically... Stop. Singaporean food is popular with Singaporeans? Yes. Amongst okay, others. Go on. All right. Amongst others. But Singaporeans uh, eat, uh, eat <coughs> from hawkers uh, extremely frequently. Yeah. So, um, so basically, our challenge is how do we actually bring that on the platform? It's very cheap. Singaporeans are, are used to paying very low prices for this. So finding the margin is exactly. super challenging. Exactly. But we know that, uh, that yeah, basically that's what Singaporeans want to eat. So that's something that we've been very, uh, working very, very hard on uh, there. Where do you find that margin? Sorry? Where do you find that margin? We tend to, uh, to, to increase prices a little bit. We create bundles, we create combos, and we've been working also on merge menus. So I don't know how familiar you are with uh, Singapore and the hawker scene. You basically get to a place and you have all of these different stalls. You don't want to eat from just one stall. You want to be able to eat from multiple stalls. So you would do like a Maxwell Street menu rather than just a Tian Tian chicken rice? Exactly. Ah, And so cool. you'll probably order multiple items instead of just one. Interesting. And I hear that you guys are making some smart moves on waste as well. Absolutely, yeah. So um, in, uh, we've, uh, we have an opt-in, opt-out uh, cutlery option when you order on uh, Deliveroo. And actually here in Australia, uh, we're working with Returner, um, which is a system where basically the restaurant signs up. Um, the, the consumer pays, I think, uh, it's a couple of dollars in order to be able to use this, uh, this, uh, this product. And um, basically, it's... Um, it's, uh, it's like a swap and go. So is exactly. it like you deliver me a meal, I eat out of this container, and then the next time I order a meal from you, I swap the, the container out? Actually, you return it to the restaurant, and you get uh, your 5 or $6 that you paid uh, back. So that's a way to reduce wastage. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, it's been, it's been definitely uh, super useful. Another way of, uh, of reducing waste is uh, through a tool that we call Marketer. Marketer is self-service promotions. So basically, restaurants are able to, to do promotions and discounts by themselves online. They know when they have certain items that are you know, at 6 p.m. when they're gonna close their restaurants or at 7 p.m., they know that uh, they might have a surplus of certain items or certain ingredients. We used to call these specials in the restaurant business. Absolutely. <laughs> you should really have the fish, sir. It's particularly delicious today. <laughs> but so they have the ability to actually discount uh, those specific products at the time that they want. So dynamic pricing. Yes. In order, to, in order to reduce waste. Have you ever thought about doing it the other way? Have you ever thought about making burgers really expensive at 10 o'clock on Friday nights? Or kebabs at like midnight? I don't know. There could be something in that, folks. I'm not sure. Yes, we have. <laughs> John, where, do we, where are we going to be 20 years from now? We walk into a restaurant in Australia, you know, if we step off our hoverboard, take off our mirrored shades. Oh wait, that was Back to the Future and that was two years ago. We're, we're 2020, let's, sorry, 2040. Gosh, 2020 is next year. Let's say we're 2040. What is a restaurant experience gonna look like? You'll probably be stepping off your drone. <laughs> um, if, if we've gotten off the couch at all, that is. We've gotten off the couch using our, our, our Google Glass to order or potentially our smart tables, which is basically a big table that's uh, made of an, basically a big iPad um, that you can order from. Um, I, I think that the, the, the major thing that we expect in the future is that people are going to continue uh, to be very values driven, uh, making sure that uh, the, 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 the restaurants that they're interacting with or the brands that they're interacting with um, uh, uh, 
prescribed to some sort of ethical um, uh, waste um, policy. Um, in our case, you know, with Vudamon particularly, uh, we're closed loop. Uh, restaurant with no uh, landfill waste whatsoever. You don't uh, make enough of that. Did you guys know that Voodamon was a closed loop restaurant? You do well, now. Now you do. Write that down. There you go. Tweet that. Um, also, uh, people will be hyper connected, so they'll be able to to broadcast what they're doing at all times. And so you're describing today, though, essentially. But I'm I'm describing the future as well. I think that uh, that there'll be more live streaming of what people are doing, which is kind of freaky. Uh, people could be, will be able to keep tabs on what people are doing, like all the times within different sort of groups that you can. You can pick. Look at a, look at Instagram right now um, with stories. They have close friends, so you can choose to broadcast certain things to, to close friends and, and, and to wider groups. Um, we think that the segmentation will will continue to to to, to get more um, granular. Um, we think that people will continue to be health conscious. So one thing that we've noticed is that uh, something like 87% um, of the, the diners that are coming to um, our, our two Michelin, uh, sorry, our two, our two chef's hat um, restaurants um, are interested in incorporating some sort of um, uh, plant-based diet into their, into their weekly regimen. 87% of 87%. the customers at your hat at restaurants. Yeah, are interested in having a fine dining experience that's driven by um, a plant-based uh, um, menu. Um, that is, on, on a special occasion, mm. they'll still be uh, meat-driven, but what we're finding is, is that they'll, I think that in the future, they'll be more of a meat is a treat um, type That's attitude. snappy, meat is a treat. Yeah. I can't is that yours? That's great. Yeah. Um, People will be increasingly tech savvy. Um, different platforms will be much easier to use. Um, you know, obviously, people are social already using the different social platforms. Uh, collaborative, but the other thing is I think that people will be incredibly time poor. So different micro innovations like uh, using geofencing to, to notice a, uh, a guest when they walk in um, and, and know their customer profile up front could be very interesting in the future. I'm into that. Um, uh, gentlemen, do you feel like customer expectations are rising faster than the trade is keeping pace? Who wants to take that one? Yeah, I can definitely start with that. I think, um, as I alluded to earlier, you know, I think there's this interesting um, dilemma between the cost of labor and the profitability of, of survival. Um, and we're all having to reduce the front of house team by one or two on the floor um, at a time when expectation is actually rising by our customers. So we want stuff faster, we want stuff quicker, we want less friction. So we're kind of at this And we want to know everything about it now. We want to, yeah, absolutely. And we want it faster than we've ever had it before. So there's definitely a, um, you know, a, um, a disconnect between the operator and the customer on that side. But I think, you know, to John's point, you know, I think we're at a time where the new service standard for me is that you don't want to have a chat with the waiter for five minutes about how the weekend was. You want to get in, you want to order something quickly, you want to have a great meal with the people that you're there with and you just want to get out at the end and go because your Uber's outside and you're running late for a meeting. So I think efficiency and convenience for me is a new service standard that we need to make sure that people can get in, get out, have a great meal and just put it, walk out with a smile on their face. And for me, that's a new service standard that you know, customers are coming to expect because of platforms like Uber. It sounds almost, it sounds a little bit dystopian, but I'm glad that you threw in a smile there. Can what I, do can, you think? Oh, can, John, please. Sorry, can I offer like a contrarian view of, please do, uh, of please that do. as well against some of the data that, that, that we're seeing um, uh, arise? I actually think that, uh, that there'll be a place as well, there'll be a backlash with all this connectedness. And I think that they'll it's be... It's happening right now. It's hap and, 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 you know, even the idea of, of having, uh, uh, having an analog dinner service where we actually scramble, like, cell phone service and just make sure that people are just enjoying, enjoying their meals or, or get people to put their, their mobile phones in a, in a bin on the way in just so that they can enjoy the gustatory experience and, you know, lift up the, the you know, lift the, lift the game within that service. Yeah. I went to a fine dining restaurant in Berlin only a couple of months ago that has a no phone policy. Like they encourage you, like like you, at, if you're at a nightclub in Germany, they'll put a sticker on your phone to encourage you to, you know, put the phone down and enjoy the moment. Um, 
when we can have whatever we want. Oh, do you want to buy in on that? I, I just, you know, there is, you know, I, I'm, I'm one of the most anti-tech people, contrary to what this sounds like. Cause He's I, not even wearing socks, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> but I, I, I do think that there's a role and a place for no technology. I just, I just think that fighting against what the customer clearly wants and is obsessing over is not delivering on a great customer experience. If the customer wants to use tech, allow them to use it. Allow them to use it in a quick, easy manner. If a customer wants to go and have a great experience, you know, allow them to do that. I just think we're in a world of choice and allow the customer to have whatever they want. And, you know, in the fine dining sector where I'm spending 150 bucks, Jesus, I, I don't want any tech anywhere. But in the mid-market, when I want to get in and out because I'm there for a business meeting, you know, I just kind of want to get in and out and just allow me to do that quickly and easily. You know, I think let's remember there's different sectors and different experiences for different, different customers. Actually, I can, I've got so much out of this global table, ladies and gentlemen. If I can cherry pick another fantastic quote from the uh, retail session I went to a couple of hours ago, the guys there were talking about the fact that in food retail in particular, there's a really massive divergence between the get it done kind of shopping that you, you know, would frequently go to a supermarket, supermarket for these days. Um, things I just would actually happily just have appear in my house without me having to think about it. And I think um, who gives a crap toilet paper has really tapped into that market. People don't particularly want to spend a lot of time searching through the toilet paper. If it could just be magically delivered to their house, they're happy to go for that. On the other hand, there's these other experiences where people want the shopping itself to be not a chore, but an experience, a pleasure. And, and that's the big split in food retail right now. That's the observation from our panel. So there could be some, and I, I don't want to characterize you guys as the who gives a crap of, of dining there, Laurent, by any stretch. You, you're reaching for the microphone. What are your thoughts on this? No, I think, uh, I think you're perfectly right. I think that uh, there are times when people want to have this incredible experience you know, in a fine dining uh, restaurant. Uh, and there are other times uh, when they just don't have the time or they want to stay home or they want you know, this, this, yeah, basically this flexibility of just uh, eating at the office or, or eating at home. And that's where the delivery comes into play. We're convinced at Deliveroo that we're not fighting against restaurants. We're not stealing people away from the restaurant. Very far from it. Mm. We're adding revenue. It's just another stream of revenue. However, when people are actually ordering at home, they'll want selection. They'll want super fast service. Um, you know, and they'll want, uh, they'll want uh, convenience. So that's where we have to work hard and make sure that we answer the needs of our consumers. But in no way do we, do we feel like yeah, we're, we're taking people away from the, uh, from the restaurants and keeping uh, people away from actually eating in the restaurants. Rob, you know, what do you feel about this? Look, I think we, we, we spoke a, a little bit about this before. I think that uh, a service like Deliveroo at the moment uh, wouldn't be relevant for us across certain sort of, uh, mo a, a lot of our group, really. Um, we, are, um, we are working with Deliveroo, uh, uh, you know, across our, uh, our, um, our fast casual brand. Um, and that seems to be going okay. I think that it's a value add for us. Um, I'm interested to, to see how you guys evolve to potentially add value in other places. I think that fine dining, it's not only the food, but the experience that you're going to give in your restaurant, which is not something that Deliveroo can replicate, and we're completely honest about this. You should well. totally do some people who rock up on really fancy motorbikes wearing gloves and, you know, the whole bit. I think there's a market in that. Sorry, John. Rob, you, you've just signaled to me that we have some particularly curly, difficult, and spicy well, questions from the do, audience. we do, but I thought I'd give the opportunity, rather than hiding behind an app, if someone wants to ask those curly questions from the floor, go ahead. We so. have a, a microphone. There's a question the back. Fantastic. Let's whack it up here. Hi, thanks very much. It was a really interesting set of insights. I, um, you spoke a lot about the digitisation at the front of house and the profiling of uh, consumers and so on. I wonder if you've got perspectives on the back of house, in particular with the advent of connected devices like Inet and June and Tavola, and how they might influence and impact the, the restaurant scene. I'm going, to, I'm going to throw that to you, John. You're probably best qualified to speak to tech back of house. I mean, 
our, our best speaker on this subject is the one who had a medical emergency and couldn't join us for this, but I reckon John can tackle it. I'll give it a shot. <laughs> um, look, I, I'm definitely uh, more focused on the interconnectedness with the customer and reaching them in an elegant way um, for all the different brands and, and the way that they want to be communicated to. Um, in terms of how it, 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 it technology uh, interacts with the back of house, um, I think that it comes down to making sure that our IT marketing and analytics are are reaching are reaching operations um, in a relevant way. I don't really have a, a, a deeper sort of answer for that, but maybe you've got Laurent. You can... Yeah, I think um, at Deliveroo we work hard with restaurants to integrate with their POS system in order to limit the impact that we will be having on their operations in house. We know that uh, you know when you receive uh, tens of orders uh, in a very sh uh, short amount of time, it can get quite hectic. So by integrating uh, with their POS system, we do feel that the impact will be a little bit less. Thank you. Can I just quickly talk to that one? I had a we've got a very specific example with Opera Bar in, Opera Bar in Sydney. For anyone who knows that, that's like that's a super busy venue. That, that is a high volume know, venue. Saturday lunchtime, like there's thousands of people in that space. So back of house, it's like, it is crazy. Chefs screaming, there's stuff going on, like it, it's out of control. If you think about the traditional uh, restaurant in industry, the way that we solve that problem when the kitchen slammed is that we go from four tills down to two tills. So that's a good example of us as an industry where we kind of solve a problem by making the customer experience worse. So now the customer has to stand in a queue for 10, 15, 20 minutes rather than five minutes. Not a great way, but it's the only solution we've had in the past. The, what, the way that we want to tackle that is to allow a customer to still be able to sit at the table and place orders directly from the table. Um, but they're simply notified that the kitchen's under the pump because chefs pushed the big fat red button and said, hey, <laughs> slow down. And now every customer who's placing an order from that point forward knows that food's going to take an extra 10 minutes. But... I'm not standing in a queue for 10 minutes waiting. I'm there socialising, having a beer with my mate. So customer wins and chef wins. Uh, question. If I may, can I, can I just add oh. one more thing? It has to be uh, really quick because I want super, this question. Super quick. Uh, we'll also work quite a lot with uh, restaurants and we give them the flexibility to, uh, to manage their preparation time on Deliveroo. So they know that when we... They know when they're busy, and they have the ability to increase their preparation time and therefore add a little bit of flexibility there. All right. Hi, Sir. Pa Hi Patrick Watson. Um, just a quick comment. Um, I've been around kitchens and cooking for the last 30 years, and I would say in the 80s, the 90s, and the noughties, every decade was a huge challenge for hospitality, and nothing's changed. Good to see that. Um, but moving into the contemporary day, I think, that I think the Australian diner is much more comfortable about eating in restaurants mm. and, and does it much more frequently. And I think restaurants in general do a much better job, um, especially in terms of delivering food at very prompt service rates. But just looking at the future, and one of the things I thought we did miss was that in the back of house, there are two things that I think could be quite interesting. Uh, sorry, front of house and back of house. Front of house, enhanced and virtual reality dining. Um, and, and in back of house, robotics. So in the future, it's, it's not quite foreseeable that you will have robots flipping the burgers or preparing the, bol the bolognese or the, doing the uh, bearnaise sauce um, and delivering quite promptly to the customer. I'd just like to hear your comments on that. I, I, uh, that would be for I'm, Stefan. I'd jump in and say it's actually happening already. I mean, if you go to a leading Melbourne or Sydney cafe, you'll see a piece of tech called an auto puck. Have you guys seen a, the puck machines and this tamps the coffee automatically and this is being used right now by some of the best it's, it's actually the better coffee shops that are using it not the the cheaper ones and it gives a consistent and fantastic result i think the role of robotics is going to be limited by the or challenged by the diversity of tasks that needs to be performed in a restaurant kitchen um, whereas for something like coffee, where it is repetition of a few very particular actions, I think there's real potential there. Who wants to jump on, jump on that one? I think undoubtedly robotics will play a role um, right now. Uh, you know, e even back in the 90s... Uh, I mean, a Thermomix a is sort of... Do we, do we count that as a robot? I don't know. I mean, people said a Thermomix is the equivalent of one slow-witted apprentice, so... I'm just, just repeating what the trade has told me, everyone. 
when I was in the military growing up, we lived in Japan when I was in high school. And I remember like, they, 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 they tend to be real innovators in terms of like, adoption of technology, um, but also they do that as it, it's a gimmick over there. And I remember robotic sort of restaurants doing ramen, and they're doing it now, only it's, only it's bigger scale because the robotics is becoming cheaper um, to produce. So I think undoubtedly there'll be a place for, for more robotics um, in mm -hmm. kitchens. You know? And I think you might be talking about Patricia when it comes to, um, uh, to, to the pucks. And a whole um, host of others. Yeah, absolutely. So uh, yeah, but I think that we'll just see the, the proliferation of robotics in back of the house moving ahead. Mm. Pat, we've got a question up the back here. Thanks, Rob. Hi, sorry, Stephen Lawrence. Um, I was really interested in your comments, John, about uh, the numbers of people interested in the, the plant-based diets. Um, and obviously we've seen that coming over the last 10, 20 years and, and progressing to this point. Um, I'd be interested in kind of the rest of your comments on, on how that's changing the restaurant trade and also extending that kind of similarity to the, the upcoming non-alcoholic um, kind of progression, um, which is, I could, should confess I'm in that industry. Um, I'm just interested in the similarities that uh, you all see in those two kind of trends and where you see them going. I don't, I don't have any data on the, 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 um, the interest in, um, in non-alcoholic um, uh, beverages. Um, and, and, I, and your product's very good, by the way, the, the non-alcoholic gin. Um, but uh, in terms of uh, the interest in, in plant-based and, and vegan diets, we, we, we have un undoubtedly, we have very strong data um, from a survey of about 4,000 of our, of our followers that suggests that people really, really are interested in having, incorporating more of a plant-based uh, focus in a, in a fine dining setting. Um, if you look at uh, uh, the sister restaurant to uh, View de Mona, Ikejime, uh, we have a very strong uh, plant-based uh, um, variety on that, uh, on, on that menu. And I think that you'll continue to see that grow um, right across uh, the group. I think we have time for one more question, but it has to be a particularly difficult and convoluted one. <laughs> it won't be that hard at all. Um, it's probably for more Stephen and Laurent. Um, Connor, is that you? That's me, it is, which happened just before. Um, considering that, I guess, you know, this is talking about consumers actually leaving their places of work to go and eat, but we spend the majority of our time in our workplace consuming food. Do either of you see opportunities or what you're working on to actually enhance that workplace food experience? Because consumers are eating more and more at their work as well. So I'm just interested to know, probably from both of you, where you probably see that fitting into your, your work out, or it just more, you're really waiting on people to go to restaurants or just sitting at home and getting their food? We're investing actually quite a lot in our delivery for business team. So basically a team that just focuses on food within the, within the uh, a corporate environment, within the workspace. And our aim is to be able to bring you any kind of food that you want or drink yes. at any time. Yes. So that's, that's what we're working on. How are we actually doing this? Uh, we're growing the team, so investing in resources, making sure that selection is as varied as possible, working on catering, um, and, and yeah, basically working on uh, making sure that if you want to eat in the office, you'll be able to find uh, something on delivery for this. On top of that, um, you'll have you know, dedicated account management, which will make the whole ordering uh, a, lot, uh, a, lot more, a lot easier. And in terms of invoicing, uh, we're able to invoice you at the end of the month instead of paying upfront. So it's a little bit easier in terms of uh, the, expense, uh, the expense part. So for those of you who are a fan of the idea that history works in cycles, the tea trolley is coming back to the office. Finally, thank goodness. Ladies and gentlemen, um, I've really enjoyed your company. I've really enjoyed these guys' company. If you've enjoyed their company as much as I have, or possibly even more, will you please join me in thanking John Anson, Laurent Stevenard, and Stephen Promutico. Thank, thank you so much. much. Give it up for the panel. And thank you, Rob. Fantastic.